All right, terrific. Hi, my name is Donald Barrett, and welcome to a brand new live edition of the Barrett Report. And I think the Patriots are playing tonight, so I know we're competing with the Patriots, but I know a lot of people will wa be watching this in uh, rebroadcast. But we have a very, very fascinating show on tap tonight. We're going to be talking about a few different things. Um, next week's show, I'm going to be talking about FICO oil and the benefits of cannabis oil. Um, that, that show has been moved to next week. Um, but this particular week, I wanted to go over some of the things that are going on with the election and some of the questions. Because we've been getting so many different um, questions, emails, phone calls from our listeners, you know, asking for, for clarification on things. And we wanted to make sure that this week, with the election coming up November 6th, which is Tuesday, uh, also my son's birthday, um, uh, that you have all the information you need. So when you go into the ballot box, you, 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 can, make, you can make a good decision. Now, before I get into it, I know a lot of people watch my show and you hear a lot of different things about Donald Barrett and the Barrett Report and you know, you can Wikipedia me and I'm, and I'm pretty much, you know, all over the internet. But folks, what I've really been doing, um, and let me just back up. I, I grew up in Ma Massachusetts. I grew up in a little town um, that many of you are familiar with because of Route 1. I grew up in Saugus, Massachusetts. Um, my father was in the union. My, my mother was a hairdresser. We didn't grow up wealthy by, by any means. Um, but, you know, I, I played sports growing up. I played quarterback for Saugus High School. I was really, you know, never a really great, great student. Um, I did wind up going to three different colleges. I went to Lynn University, Framingham State, and Mount Ida. Uh, I was always invited not to come back. Uh, so I was, I was never really a great student. And, you know, I found myself in the workaday world. And I was making pizzas. And this is the truth. I was making pizzas on, on Route 1, you know, the Leaning Tower, Prince Pizza. Uh, Steve Castaberti is a great friend of mine, still a great friend of mine. They have giggles. Um, I mean, it, it's one of the best pizzas out there. But that's what I worked. I wor worked at Prince Pizza full time. I grew up in Saugus, and I'm working at Prince Pizza, and I tried college three different times, and, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, life isn't too good right now, that I'm going to have to bust my butt the rest of my life to, you know, try to, try to make ends meet. And what happened was, you know, one morning I was actually, they, they go in and pound the pizzas early, so I went in and I was making pizzas, and a, and a young kid, Dave, came in. And he shared with me a, uh, a book. Uh, he was in like one of these companies like Herbalife or um, one, one of these, these multi-level marketing companies. And he shared with me a book called The Magic of Thinking Big. And this is, this is the book right here. I, I always have a thousand copies because I give them out. And I went from someone that, you know, was not very interested in life, not really thinking I had a future because of my college education. And after I read this book, as um, my friend Zig Ziglar says, it gave me a check up from the neck up and really aligned my thinking process. And it allowed me to really believe I could achieve really anything I, 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 I wanted. And this was really the start of my learning process because when I when I left college and I decided not to go back to college, I decided maybe I wasn't going to be schooled, but I definitely wanted to be educated. Okay, so I started to read books like crazy. You know, another book that I read is, uh, and I have it here, is called *The Law of Success* by Napoleon P by Napoleon Hill. Um, this is actually a reprint of the original, original version um, that um, we, we purchased off the internet. And 
A lot of people have heard of Napoleon Hill as it relates to a book called Think and Grow Rich. And a lot of people don't know that the Think and Grow Rich is really the watered down version of the law of success. So I started reading these books, almost like a lawyer. I mean, would study for the bar exam. I started to read these books and I would highlight and I would learn. And what happened was I came across a book called Seven Steps to Freedom. It was a guy by the name of Benjamin Suarez. I don't have a copy of that book. I don't even know if you can find one today. Um, but he talked about the direct marketing business. Now my friend Dave that gave me these books that was trying to recruit me for multi-level marketing and with all great intentions, you know, I was, I, I was making pizzas, I had a broken down car, I had a coat hanger for an antenna on my car going to work every day, and, and going out and talking to people about a financial opportunity, they would look at me like I was crazy. But as I was starting to devour these books, I, I came across this book, Seven Steps to Freedom, How to Escape the American Rat Race, which I, I felt myself falling into every day, where you know, we call the American Rat Race is you work 40 years, 40 hours a week, and most people retire broke with less than a couple thousand dollars in the bank, relying on others for, for their basic necessities. And, you know, I, I, that, that book struck me. And it talked about direct marketing. And direct marketing was different than network marketing because direct marketing, you could actually place an ad and people would pick up the phone or go to your website based on the ad that was written, not based on me pulling up to their car with a coat hanger <laughs> for an antenna. So, I started to do the direct marketing business and I studied television infomercials. And in 1984, actually Ronald Reagan deregulated advertising, which allowed infomercials to be born. Now, I graduated from high school in 1993, so this was a few years later, but television infomercials was still the hottest form of marketing in the direct response area, if you will. So I decided, to, I decided to learn direct response marketing. And I learned very quickly that it cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to even produce shows. Um, I learned a lot of different things. I also learned that most shows that companies produce, and there's only really a handful of TV infomercial companies out there, most shows that they produce, the shows don't work. And what I mean is they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars pre-production, hiring movie stars, doing all these things, and they put the show on the air, and they don't get enough phone calls or enough people to go to the website to get the show to work after spending hundreds of, of thousands of dollars. And I figured out why. I mean, the reason why is, it, it, A, you know, they're not buying their own media, and media is very negotiable. And most of them at the time were outsourcing their calls to India, where they were getting half the closing rate that they really should have got if someone just spoke English, and they kept the jobs in the United States. So what I did is I went to a bunch of different companies, and I said, hey, I know you've produced all these infomercials. You know, we call them net profit generators. The, you know, net profit generator sitting on the shelf. I said, if you just let me take one of those shows, put my 800 number on the show, and I'll buy the product from you wholesale, I can make that show work. And I did, I started a little company out of my mother's house. Okay, right above the garage. I had three, phone, three phones. Um, I actually, they were big cubicles, so I, I put them in, cut them in half, so that was actually six phones at one point. And it was right above the garage, so we shipped the product out of the garage. And the first, one of the first shows I licensed or got from a company was a show called Dr. Mortar's Dynamic Health. Uh, Kevin Trudeau licensed me the show, uh, Dr. Mortar's Dynamic Health, and it was a health program on alkalizing the body. 
Um, and it was a, it was a terrific program. Um, I was answering the call, shipping the product, buying the media, so, were, so was a, a few other people, neighbors, friends, everybody that could help with what was coming over and helping. But I was answering the calls one day and a lady came, called in. And frankly, I wasn't making much money selling the Dr. Morta program, but I was learning the business. I was buying the media, answering the phone, shipping the product, I was learning the business. One day a lady called in and started telling me about a product called Coral Calcium. Now at the time, it was really an unknown product. Nobody really knew about it. There was an infomercial called CalMax that was on television before that, but um, when I said I wanted to do another infomercial on calcium, people thought I was crazy. And then when I told people I want to do it with a guy named Bob Barefoot, <laughs> they thought I was really crazy. However, what happened was I took the phone call and this lady started telling me about, me about this product, Coral Calcium. And she sent me a tape, an audio tape, and she sent me a sample of the product. Now at the time, my brother and father were just diagnosed with, with cancer. The same weekend, my, my brother, Ricky was diagnosed with astrocytoma brain cancer. He was only thir 36 years old. He had three young kids, three, six, and nine. And my father had um, liver cancer. N never, never, never drank. Never seen him drink a beer in his life. But you know, he comes up with liver cancer, and um, you know, retired early. Thank God he did live ten years. My brother wound up dying a year later. But when I got this tape and I started listening about the coral calcium, it really made me think. And I think if, if you're out there and you or someone you love has cancer or you know someone that has a loved one that has cancer, and let's face it, folks, one out of two Americans today are going to get cancer sometime in their life. I mean, th th those are the, the sad facts. But if, if you have, you, you start thinking about all the, the, all the options. Every time you see something in the newspaper, you're reading it. You see something on the internet, you're reading it. There's all this type of information out there and really you're bombarded with, with information. And what I did is I started to interview people for my television series. It was called ITV. And I interviewed all type of alternative health professionals, not just guys like Bob Barefoot, but medical doctors, oncologists, all types of people on all types of products that help prevent or reverse chronic degenerative diseases with natural products. And I know a lot of you watching right now believe that. You believe in natural products. And you don't understand the forces that are at work against us in this country. When you, when, you, when you think about the FDA and the FTC and how counterproductive they are with us, you know, the FTC, for instance, the FDA has a law, and I, I, don't, I know a lot of people don't know this, but there's a law that the FTC has in place, which is unconstitutional anyway, that says nothing can cure, prevent, or treat a disease unless it's a drug. Now, I want you to think about how preposterous that is. I mean, we know, I mean, a lot of people watching right now know that, for instance, um, like the Limeys during the days of uh, the sailing ships, Limeys, you know, they all got scurvy. People used to get scurvy, all the ship, you know, the, the pirate, you know, the people sh in shipping got scurvy. But when they ate the limes, they noticed they didn't get scurvy. Vitamin C is a cure for scurvy. But since scurvy is a disease, now nothing, according to the FDA, nothing can cure, prevent, or treat a disease unless it's a drug. Now the big problem with that is everything is now considered a disease. You used to be shy. Now you have social anxiety disorder. You used to get tired legs at night. Now you have restless leg syndrome, okay? They, they come up with the names for diseases 
so nothing can cure, prevent, or treat them, or companies that have natural products that actually work that can't afford the studies that the FDA need for you to be able to make these claims, they can't even tell you what their products do. You know, I, I have friends like uh, Kevin Trudeau, is a good, you know, he wrote the book Natural Cures, More Natural Cures. He's been in prison now for six years talk, and just because of talking about natural products, natural products and promoting natural products and virtually everything he said in his book uh, you know, was either true at the time or is, has been proven to be true now, which is pretty interesting. But the FTC and the FDA is at work against us because they don't want anything to cure, prevent, or treat a disease unless it's a drug. Now, when it comes down to cancer, I want you to think about this. The cancer industry has an Alice in Wonderland definition of a cure. And you can look it up. This is a fact. If you are diagnosed with cancer and you are breathing five years from now, even if you still have cancer, if you're breathing five years from now, you are considered by the cancer industry cured of cancer. So, so technically my dad who had liver cancer, who died, who lived for 10 years, almost 11 years, not only was he cured of cancer, but he died of cancer. Okay, so now what, what does this mean? When you see things on the news like, what, what are, what are the, the survival rates, like the, the five-year survival rates, they say, oh yeah, the five-year survival rates, they're getting better and they're getting better. Folks, the only thing that's getting better is early detection. Come in early for your mammograms, come in early for your colonoscopy, come in early for all these tests so they can detect these things earlier. In the machines that they have, in the technology they have, they, they, can, can, they can detect these things a lot earlier. So the chances of you living five years from now and breathing is a lot greater. So you really can't believe what you're told. I mean, we've been told by uh, the, the Cancer Society that the uh, cure has been right around the corner for, for decades. But the bottom line is my brother and my father both were diagnosed with cancer. My, my, my brother died a year later, had three children at the time, three, six, and nine. My father, who was my, my best friend in the whole world, lived, lived for 10, almost 11 years with liver cancer. And I was with him every step, step of the way. He went back and forth to Florida. I traveled with him. I spent as much time as I possibly could um, with him. I mean, my dad was always my best friend. I'd talk to him every day. And I know a lot of people don't have that type of relationship, but that was the relationship I had. So when I lost my dad, it was you know, also like you know, losing my, my best friend. And two years after my mother, my father died, my mom was diagnosed, if you can believe it, with, with lung cancer. Virtually never smoked, just a little bit when she was a kid. And after seeing her lose her son to brain cancer, and then lose her, her husband, my father, okay, to liver cancer, now to be diagnosed with lung cancer, I mean, it just seemed unfair. And I took a lot of time off work. I took her to the doctors, back and forth for chemotherapy treatments. And she suffered and suffered and suffered. And she listened to her doctors. And she kept on taking the chemotherapy. And she got sicker and sicker and sicker. And hey, I'm not, I'm not you know, totally against chemotherapy. It does work for some people, but in my experience, in my family, it hasn't worked. And it makes me really ill when I walk into these hospitals. And I don't even know how some of these nurses, and I have to give them credit for walking into these oncology wards. And I mean, they can't even touch the medicine with their, with their hands, you know, when they, when they hang it up and the, the chemo's dripping, um, it, 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 you know, it's get, get going into the patient. I mean, it's really, I mean, it's sad because they know that most of them are going to die. 
it's sad. There has to be a change. And there has to be a change and it has to start somewhere. But they've spent billions, trillions, trillions of dollars on the cancer industry. And, you know, there's not a lot of things out there that people can point to. And, you know, that's how I got into the industry. And I started, like I said, interviewing a lot of health professionals. And what happened to me was I, I actually got fined by the Federal Trade Commission over, over $50 million for talking about natural products on television. Okay? It was either natural products or on television or, you know, we're going to charge you with some tax thing. But, you know, the FDA and the FTC, they came after me. They, they, they ruined my family. I had a, I had a young child at the time. They put 350 people out of work, fined me $50 million, told the public I'm selling a drug without a license when I'm selling natural products in books. He said, oh, the book is a medical device. The book is a medical device? We opened it up, looked at the pages. Well, it looks like a book to me. There's words. It's only a medical device if you shove it up. You, you, you. <laughs> Whatever, it's not a medical device. Okay, so, so I fought the FTC, I lost, and I really, it really turned my life upside down. I got fined f over $50 million, I lost my house, I lost my fam family, who I'm still very close to, but it caused a lot of issues in, in my life. And I decided to really go a another way. I decided to do sales in another industry for a few years. But recently, the cannabis industry, you know, came up and it, it, it's been widely talked about. And the medicinal benefits with cannabis, CBD, THCA, are things that I knew about. Because my brother, one of the things I knew with my brother with brain cancer, is even though he had access to every narcotic, you know, that under the sun, the only thing that helped him feel better in his skin was THC and, and, and actually smoking cannabis. Now today you don't have to smoke it, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. But when he was sick, I, I, was, I was like 21 years old. I mean, this was over 20 years ago, I'm 44 now. So this, is, this was a big stigma back then, you know, was smoke, you know, smoking cannabis, but it was relieving his symptoms. My parents would never try it, even though they had cancer. They were at that age where they couldn't distinguish heroin from cannabis. And if there wasn't a nurse, like, you know, thank God for, you know, groups like uh, uh, greennurse.com for, you know, giving education and getting education out to people so they know there, there are some medicinal benefits for this. And there are more coming out all the time. And one of the reasons I did this show is to have experts, authors, some of the most well-respected people in the industry come on the show and talk about cannabis, the endocannabinoid system, and, and how, it, how it can work for people. Okay? So I want people to know that I started in this industry 20 years ago. And I've been doing the same thing for 20 years. I've been talking about alternative products that I believe can help fight, prevent, and, and reverse disease. And, and Rick Simpson oil, you know, this RSO is a big major thing, a big major factor that a lot of people are talking about. We actually produced a couple of infomercials and there's a few books coming out on it. But the reason I got back into this industry was because of the medicinal benefits of, of cannabis and getting the word out to people. This, th th this is what I do and this is what I've been doing for a long time. So it's, it, it's, it's pretty much exciting for me because we're really blessed at this time I mean, in my life, to have cannabis become legal. I mean, think about it. When 
cannabis be was illegal, okay, think about the disease rates and how much less the disease rates were back then than they are today. And in, you know, um, Israel, where a lot of these studies are done on the endocannabinoid system, that they're finding that the endocannabinoid system in many people are depleted, and that, be, that could be causing a whole host of different types of, you know, um, challenges, conditions, and ailments in people. Now, again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, I'm just reporting, and I just let people know what is going on. And I tell you exactly how I feel. So when you get my opinion on the show, it's not because I'm, I'm, I'm getting paid from some, from, from some sponsor or something. When I give you an opinion on my show, it's because it's my opinion. And after 20 years of doing research, I think I, I know a thing or two about a thing or two. So I'm excited that um, we're doing the show and, you know, and there's so much information coming out, it's really unbelievable. So we want to make sure that the lines are open because if you do want to call in, um, I'm not sure if he's on the line yet. Just hold on for one second. Okay, okay, perfect. All right, so tonight on the Cannabis Radio Network, we're going to really get into it now. So I wanted to give you a little bit of my story, and if you have any questions, you can always email me or, or, or you know, ask, ask me questions. You know, I, I have four, three beautiful children, really four. I have a stepson as well. Um, my youngest son's birthday is on the 6th, on Election Day. Um, I have a nine-year-old daughter. I have a... 15-year-old daughter who's a cheerleader who, I mean, keeping up with her is like a whole nother story. And um, a 16-year-old stepson as well. So, you know, it's, it's I'm, I'm a busy guy. I'm a real busy guy, but this is one of the most fascinating, one of the most interesting industries that I could ever be a part of. I wake up every day excited to read and I pour through all the information. You know, this week on, on, on the show, we're, we're going to be talking about, uh, and Mike Crawford's, I, I think, on the line now, we're going to be talking about question one, question two, and uh, what's going on with the, the election. Uh, hold on for one second, see if I can get them connected. Hey, Mike, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Hey, I, Donald. Hey, Mike, how are you? Thanks for calling in tonight. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I know it's kind of a, a late uh, notice. Um, now, you, you your uh, your radio show is the Young Jerks, right? J U R K S, right? Just, Correct. Just so people are yeah. aware and know of your show. Um, I mean, it's one of the most popular shows out there in cannabis in, in Massachusetts. So you know, kudos to you. And I know a lot of people follow you and listen to you and really re respect your opinion. So I want to thank you for being on the show. Um, Thanks for having Yeah, I mean, I had a few things, you know, and, and, I, and I know, you know, just like a lot of people on television, me and you disagree on various things and questions and whatnot. So, you know, I figured it'd be a good discussion to have you on to talk about, you know, maybe que question one, question three, and maybe about the, uh, the, the Maloney uh, Collins race a little bit. Sounds good. Rollins race, I'm yeah, sorry. I think, we, <laughs> I, I think we agree definitely on question one. Oh, yeah. I, I'm, mean, uh, I think everyone should vote yes on it. You know what's interesting to me, Mike, is I, is I drive through Boston a lot. My kids are on the, the, the South Shore, so I go through Boston a lot. And I see on all the hospitals, and, you, you know, uh, nurses vote 
no on question one. And I've been hearing from a lot of nurses that they're getting a lot of pressure at work through newsletters, through supervisors, whatever, to vote, to vote no. And the reason, that's right. the reason is it's going to cost the hospitals money. I, that, that's what I've been that's told. Right. Anyways, I don't know. Yeah, what, yeah, what do you I know? That's right. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's nurses that, you know, it's funny, like, to the hospital, exactly. The administration puts out these signs saying the nurses say no, but it's the administration, it's the owners. And then a nurse will wear a yes, yes on one pin while she's working, and they'll tell her to take it off. And a lot of nurses are saying, no, you, you, you take that down that sign out front and I'll take off my pen, you know? So it's just, it's crazy. Um, and most nurses are yes on it. And I think it's a low cost way to help, uh, healthcare, you know, the wait times. I think it makes sense. And, uh, I hope it passes. Well, from what, what I've heard from nurses is the nurses have been the ones asking for this for quite some time. They've been asking they have for, been, for this bill to be on, you know, to, to be made into law for for a long time, and they're asking for a That's reason. Right. And as a patient, the, I feel better as a patient. Knowing, right. knowing. I that, mean, I know. Go yeah, ahead. People wait ridiculous a long times for, for health care, and I've worked in hospitals. I was a financial advisor, so a lot of my customers were nurses, and I used to go to the hospitals, and th that was years ago, a decade ago. It, They've been understaffed for decades, overworked, understaffed. They make good money, but it's a very stressful job when you have that many patients under one nurse. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so, I had one nurse say on the, on the night shift that there was one nurse responsible for 20 patients. I mean, right. I mean when that happens, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm no mathematician, but people die. If someone's right. sick, I mean, it's if common. someone's sick, I mean, how many places can you be? Right. And the nurses have been and asking for this. Yep. But they, the, they should add nurses and cut back on uh, administrators. Now, am, am I right? And I'm not sure, but I, most hospitals are for-profit companies. They're, non -pro, they're not non-profit companies. So these companies are for-profit companies, which have a fight. Yeah, well, that's not, most of them. Let me just say, that's not quite true. Like the big okay. brands, like partners and mass, yeah. but they run like, you know what, Donald, they run like a for profit. Like the guy getting paid at the top is getting paid like a for profit. So what difference does it make? Like they call themselves nonprofit partners. It's traditionally a nonprofit, but you know what they, all they care about is increasing, increasing the amount that they charge, increasing their profit. They're, they're, they're for profit. It's like, medical dispensaries that have been pretending to be nonprofit because they had to be because of the law but we know, we know better yeah, it's they, for they, profit. they're just not increasing the profits for their shareholders they're increasing the profits so they can get paid a bigger salary <laughs> a lot of times there you go right but it's it, you that's know. it and they can buy more hospitals and, and raise the prices on the smaller hospitals that they buy and that's what they've been doing so yeah Yes on yes on one. Yes on one. All right. So we agree, but I, I just can't believe the advertisements that I see out there saying nurses are saying no. When every nurse, and I talk to a lot of nurses, I work with a nurse group. I talk to a lot of nurses and nurses every day. Unfortunately, uh, not unfortunately, but I do talk to nurses every day, not for myself, just in this business. And I don't know one of them that's voting no on question one. So it's it's very yeah, interesting. Yeah. So I'm glad we uh, you know we agree there. Now question three, tell me tell me a little bit about question three, and uh, w w where you are on it. Well, I I think the part that people have jumped to is already the law. So like you know if you don't have a problem with things right now, you shouldn't have a problem with saying yes on question three. You know I think some people are afraid for undue reasons. You know, and I think it's about equality. It's it's about making sure that people are treated equally. Trans, you know, uh, gay, lesbian, queer people are treated equally. And I, if you read it, I think that's what most people should do, too. If you're not sure on question three, just read it. Read what it says. And when you read it, I think that most reasonable people are going to say yes on question three. Now, th this is a law that you're saying the law is in place right now. So if, if you're okay with what's going on right now, they're not talking about building extra bathrooms and all these extra costs no. or anything like that. They're just saying, and, I, and this is what a lot of people get nervous about is, you know, if you have children or younger, you know, you, your child 
and I know I never let my child go in the bathroom by himself anyways, but you know, I mean, who wants to go into a bathroom with somebody of the opposite sex? It's just, it's sometimes it's, it, it's, it's scary. It, sometimes it's scary for people. So I can understand it on both ends of it, but the bottom line is I, 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 it hasn't been a problem for so many years. And the numbers that right. I'm, I'm looking at, okay, it looks like 0.6% of the population are, are, are transgender. That's I, right. I, I mean, 0 0.57, 0 0.57 was just transgender in 15 and 16. I mean, people should have equal rights, and they, 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 they have public accommodations already. So it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. But, you know, I just think it's... If, if it's not costing us a lot of money, that's that's one thing. But you know, some people think, oh, they're building extra bath. They're gonna have to build extra bathrooms. Nope. They're gonna. Nope. It, it, it's nope. not. It's not costing. Nope. A, you know, you don't have to build an extra bathroom. You just have to just, you know, accommodate what the what you know what the person identifies as. And I don't think that there will be any issues. If there were, you know, if a, like you know, I know a lot of people are scared that a man's gonna go in there. Like and molest their child. If that, if anything like that happens, there's other things that they will be charged with. Believe me, you know. So this is this is you know for what it's intended for people who are transitioning and they feel more comfortable in a woman's room because they feel like they'll get beat up in a man's room, you know, which has happened to a lot of trans people in the past. Right. So, thank God. Right. I think that's the most controversial part of that law. But if you look at question three and really read it. Most of it's not even about the bathroom. It's, it's really just about equality, that people don't get fired from jobs because they're trans. Right. You know, just for that fact, it's really about protecting their rights as equal citizens, which, you know, statistically, they haven't been protected at all for a long time. So this is a long time coming. So, I mean, when, you mean, they, they, when they apply for jobs, they have to say or declare themselves transgender today? I, I didn't even know that. No, I, 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 I don't think they have to declare. I'm not, I'm not an expert on that, but I, okay. it, it, this is to protect them from employment discrimination, whether upon hiring um, and firing. Like, you know, people uh, do get discriminated against because of their their gender and their choice. So it, that's part of it as well. Right. All right. Interesting. You know, I mean, uh, let, let the people decide on that one. I mean, I think it's up in the air, but, you know, question three. I, I, I don't I don't know if, if it's a law in place it's not bothering me right now if it's not bothering anybody else right now maybe it's something that they keep in place but I don't see too many people unfortunately that are I, I don't think it yeah, I, I think question one and three might may actually lose too that, those, it's very interesting to see what happens on those but it doesn't uh, look good for either one of them right now in the polls yeah but you know, after the last election, I I, I haven't believed the poll. <laughs> I haven't believed the poll in a, a while, Trace. Um, you know, it was, it was, yeah. So it was off, definitely with Trump. All right, so let let let's talk about Attorney General for Suffolk County, and I know you're you're uh, uh, Rachel Rollins supporter. And you know, yeah. I, you know, obviously, I, I've been to I've been to both debates. I, I, I know Mike, I know, uh, you know, enough about the issues. Now, it, it, from your standpoint, wh why do you think Rachel is the better candidate? I think for a number of reasons. Number one, I think the experience issue that you talked about. Okay. She's actually led prosecutions. She's led off, you know, led, she's worked within offices who have prosecuted. She's worked within the government. Michael... I love him. I think he's a great defense attorney. I think he's a you know a good person um, in terms of you know his past work, but I think it's kind of one dimensional. And I don't think he has the relationships in the city of Boston and within that district that Rachel Rawls has with people like Mayor Walsh. You know, with the other leaders, I think that she can actually push policy when she's elected more than Michael Maloney ever would be able to. And I think it has a lot to do with who she is, her background, her history. And I think that she's also going to be the winner. I think that's really, for me, being in the cannabis space, knowing for the first time we're going to have a person elected, no matter what, if it's Michael Maloney or Rachel Rollins that supports cannabis. Yeah, for the first that'll time. That'll be the first time in that, yeah. ever. Right. So, so either way, I, you know, we I win. <laughs> right. Right. Because 
every other time in mass, like every decrim, medical, legal, it was always the district attorneys who funded, they took money out of their own salaries to campaign against us. They didn't just spend time on it. They spent their own money and they were the only ones like, so for the first time we'll have somebody who's on our side. So I'm, I'm happy about it either way. Right. Like I said, I, I've been to both debates. I, I know uh, Michael uh, has some uh, background in the cannabis industry. I, I didn't know him be prior prior to him running for office, so I, I only met him recently. But when I when I read her decline to prosecute list, okay, things like um, declining to prosecute drug dealing, trespassing, shoplifting. I mean, one of one of the one of the ones that really kind of bothers me is resisting arrest. I, I mean, for not you know, especially protecting our police officers today. And you know, if I if I was uh, the wife of a police officer and they were going out to work every day, I, I'm afraid for their lives every day. And if now there's a lot, they're not even going to get prosecuted for resisting arrest. I mean, th there's some things that scare me. Deeply about Ra Rachel. I mean, and I know they're on I the can same. Hear you and, and, I, and, I, and I'm and I'm okay. and I'm with you because they're both with cannabis. You know, I I, I think uh, Michael has a lot of energy. I, I think she has a lot of connections, and I think you're absolutely right there. But some of these things scare me. Well, I, I think on the on the decline of prosecution, I think that she's been kind of pushed back on and drilled down on. And I think that there's more to it than that. Number one, like most of those crimes aren't actually prosecuted right now in Suffolk County. The, the Globe came out with that, that right now. And this guy, the guy in there right now is pretty damn conservative. He's pretty not like good on anything. And he doesn't prosecute most of those in Boston right now. Right. No, but no, most of them that, aren't jailable offenses, but at least holding right. them account, accountable for something. Well, that's what, that's the other part of it. Like what she's talking about is, um, holding them accountable without press, without charging them. So basically say, look, if you do community service, you go back to that store that you robbed and make amends. Like, you know, my, I have a relative who got an OUI back in the day. He ran through a fence. The next morning, he was down telling the guy, I got my boy coming down to fix your fence tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like, I'm very sorry. It will never happen again. Like, he made amends uh, directly to the person that he harmed, you know? Right. And I think that's what it called restorative justice and i think that's what like we need to see more of you know you make a mistake okay what are you going to do the next day you're going to make amends you're going to fix the problem you're going to you know and, and hopefully if you do that you don't even have we don't have to waste the time with clogging the courts with stupid crimes that people hopefully you know it only happens once you right. know and you learn right. and, your there, and there are mistakes. checks and balances in place so if they do have multiple crimes you know it, you know it, things go by the wayside and things like you know it's i mean a lot of times it's right. it, 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 it's a one time thing but if they have multiple charges a lot of these things go but by the wayside but those one time things you know can really hurt people in the long run like me i when i was younger i i got the OUI and the marijuana you know what i mean so like i know like those things hurt people on background employment checks. And I know marijuana is not an issue as much for people because it's been decriminalized, but it used to be a big issue. Like people would not get jobs just because they got caught with one joint. Oh yeah. So I that, mean, people running their stores, grabbing these different drinks and these whizinators and all these different things to try right, to pass right. these drug tests, right? When they, when they can do cocaine and what is it out of their system in 24 hours or 48 hours? 48 hours. It's, hours, like, it's right. like something like that. That's and they, right. They encourage you. They encourage you to do that. You know, like I, I used to be a union guy, too, a union driver. You know, they would encourage the guys to do harder drugs. You can't smoke weed at the concert tonight. You can just take a couple bumps, though. You know, like, because you're not going to be tested until Monday. Right. You know? Right. And you can drink your face off, too, all weekend if you want. And that's fine, too. Exactly. You know, I, I right. find it interesting. Would we have 30 licenses granted by the Cannabis Control Commission in the state now? 30? Maybe, right. maybe a few more? We have 30 liquor licenses here in Lynn. <laughs> liquor licenses. I don't, right? <laughs> it's crazy. It's just like... And, that, and that's an, another race I want to mention, governor's race, because you brought that up. Sure. Like, we would be further down the line if it wasn't for Charlie Baker. And he, he rewrote the law. He made it harder for cities. and He made it harder for us to get approval in cities and towns for recreational. 
by changing it, you know, changing the way that things are done. He, they screwed up the social consumption, so now they're going to have to fix the law before before CC, you know, Cannabis Control Commission even thinks about it. He, he fought it. So every, like, he, might, he fought it every step of the way. He's not he sure happy. He's not happy. He's not happy about it. He doesn't care for. I mean, they say the state is so slow they're losing about two hundred thousand dollars a day. He, right. he don't care. He's going home to his mansion. He's fine. You don't care about the yeah. state losing two hundred grand a day. You don't care if, if if it ever gets passed. That's from 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 what I see. Yeah. No, he doesn't. It's so funny because like uh, he sits there. And he said he he was worried about the children and what message it would send to the children if we legalize cannabis, right? And he sits there and continues to campaign with the media. He does media stops at the at the tavern in South Boston or Dorchester there, drinking beer on camera. Like right. it's what is it hypocrite? Like a guy he, the guy thinks it's horrible cannabis, but it's okay to drink beer. Like I'm fine with beer, but if, if you're fine with beer, you have to be fine with cannabis, in my opinion. It's like the same thing, except cannabis is much lighter. <laughs> right. It has medical reasons. You know, I, I, like, I, I said this one time on one of my shows. I said, if you had a child, and God forbid, you know, you, your child is driving home a couple miles home from a party, would you rather them be drunk or been drinking or had, have smoked a joint? If you had, I mean, yeah, it, I'm just saying, what would you rather? Probably none, honestly, because you, you know, I don't that, want to That's the answer. That's the answer. But you have to pick one, I Mike. Have to, you have to pick but one. But if, if they're experienced, if they're experienced. So my experience is when I'm drunk, when I'm drunk, yeah. and I'm never drunk because I never drink, but when I was younger in high school and I drank, and, you know, I used to feel invincible. I'd speed up, but yeah, I'd be like, I, when I smoke, I'd like slow down. I'm like hitting the brake, right. looking left, looking right. <laughs> yeah. It's just a different well, experience. You know, I think too, like, the first time I smoked pot, it like did trip me out. Like I couldn't handle it almost when yeah. I was a kid. But then after you smoke it a certain amount of times, you're like, this is nothing. Like, it's just like drinking a cup of coffee. It's not freaking a big deal if you use it often, you know? Right. With alcohol, no matter how many times you use it, it's like, it's always, you know, you hit a point where you're just, like you said, you think you're invincible, but you're out of your mind. And you don't know what the hell's going on. And there's certainly no medicinal benefit with with alcohol. And we know now, I mean, it's a Schedule One drug, cannabis, but, I mean... It, we know there are medicinal benefits. It has to be taken off of a Schedule One drug because there are medical benefits to cannabis, CBD, and, and you know a lot of the constituents in there. So, you know, it's pretty. It's pretty. It's an exciting time. It's an exciting it time. It is. It really is. So, hey, uh, you know, I want to thank you for coming on the show, Mike. Uh, when when is your show, and when when can people catch your show? It's Saturdays at 6 o'clock, and you can watch it on our Facebook page, uh, The Young Jerks, facebook.com slash The Young Jerks, Saturdays at 6. And that's spelled J-U-R-K-S, right? K. That's correct. Perfect. And uh, we're, we're, like, really excited. We started out, like, kind of just doing it as a hobby. We never put any money into it, never really had anything behind it, and it's just grown, and we're almost at five years, and now we're actually going to, get serious about it right and it's just it's really cool it's like we've had some amazing like you know back in the day when we started you know, we we consider ourselves pretty much a political show a lot of politicians come on community affairs show and at first we you know we'd have politicians come on but they never won we could never get anyone on that was going to win a campaign right and now it's we have people that we feel like we've helped win campaigns like the state rep and state you know and that we've helped change you know, policy in the city of Boston around cannabis. You know, City Council Tito Jackson said that to us. You yeah. know, he told us that. He told us that we moved Mayor Menino, I mean, Mayor Walsh. You know, so it's just, we're really happy where we're at. And uh, it's just us, you know, we're just trying to be, move, you know, talk about issues we care about with politicians mostly. Right. And, um, you know, I, and I know you get some great information out there. I hear great, great stuff about your show and, you know, I just want to thank you for coming on our, our show and sharing a little bit because, you know, even though me and you may disagree on things from here and there, you know, I respect your opinion and, you know, I respect your opinion and, and people out there watching our show will respect your opinion as well. And uh, just thank you again for coming on. Thanks for having me. I like what you do. I appreciate that uh, you let me come on and, and 
disagree with you on some of these things too. So I think that's awesome. All right, Mike. All right, we'll talk soon. Definitely. Thank All you, right. Donald. You got it. Bye bye now. Bye. All right, there we go. That was Michael Crawford from the, the Young Jerks. They have a, a radio show. Um, you know, we disagree on a bunch of different things. We do all, and every nurse I meet, all agree, vote yes on one. And I'm going to show you a video in just a second where I interview three separate nurses, and we get their opinion. So if you're still up in the air on question one, I have a, a, a few-minute video that I'm going to play right here at the end. So, you know, help you maybe clarify your decision. You know, question three, you know, that, that, that's up in the air. You know, I think for, for so long, I mean, I, I, I think, this is what I think. Okay, I drew it before the show. If you're a man, you go to the men's room. If you're a woman, you go to the woman's room. It's that simple. I, I don't know why that has to change. I mean, <laughs> sorry, but that's what it is. Um, by the way, Mike Maloney is, in my opinion, by, by far the, the better candidate. He has more, and, and I've been to both debates, okay? Uh, I know she's avoided debates for quite some time, but I've been to both debate, debates. He definitely has more energy, more spunk, more charisma. I mean, I, I, you, you know when you see someone and you just think, I mean, this guy will do circles around her. I mean, he'll do figure eights around her just with his energy and, and charisma alone. He's a very, very unique individual. He's young, he's 38 years old, but he's been a defense attorney for 10 years helping people in some of the worst points of their life. He's actually taken time off of his, of his campaign to go and defend some of his uh, clients. So I, I really believe in Mike Baloney. I, you know, I, when I, you know, and Rachel, like I said, she, she, it's not that she's a bad person, okay? But when you're, when, I mean, drug dealing, these are things that she's going to decline to prosecute. And it was interesting, I see the electric union, and if you belong to the electric union out there, right? Uh, we all supply Rachel Rollins. Wait till your tools get stolen. Wait till your tools get stolen and no one gets prosecuted. For, for stealing them or receiving the stolen property. Threats, possession of alcohol, drug possession, resisting arrest. Today with our police officers, police officers, I mean, my God, I have a lot of friends that are police officers and I know their wives are scared every time they leave the house. And now you're gonna not you're gonna decline to prosecute resisting arrest, Rachel. I just don't think it's gonna fly. I know you're a Democrat. You're running in Boston. Michael's an independent. Surely didn't have the cash, or or the backing that you did, or the support that you have. But he has really run a great campaign. And if you live, if you live in Revere. Winthrop, Chelsea, or anywhere in Boston. And I'll say that again. If you live in Revere, Winthrop, Chelsea, and anywhere in Boston, that's all Suffolk County, or if you know somebody that lives in Revere, Winthrop, Chelsea, or anywhere in Boston, please get them to go out and vote for Mike Maloney. I'll be out there on the campaign trail, uh, you know, holding the signs, meeting people all day. So I ho hope to see you there. Um, but get people out there and, and vote. If you're, you're looking to volunteer, you can always email here, here, us, uh, here, email us here at the network, and I'll get you in contact with the campaign. But Michael Maloney is the guy, and I hope he's our, our, our future uh, Suffolk County um, DA. So I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, hope you learned a little bit about me. I'm glad we had Mike Crawford on the show. Like I said, a lot of you know, he has a uh, competing radio show and we go back and forth and we disagree on a bunch of different things. But it's nice that we can get on, on the radio and talk about these things. 
So I want to uh, leave you with a, a commercial from one, one of the former Patriots, Eric Martin, for Michael Maloney. I want to thank you for being with us. My name is Donald Barrett, and we'll see you next time on The Barrett Report. Eric Martin here, New England Patriots Super Bowl champ. I grew up in a really rough neighborhood where a lot of people I knew and cared about fell through the cracks of the criminal justice system. It made me realize how important the district attorney's office is and the impact that policies can have on individuals and families. Responsible criminal justice reform is crucial, and that's why I support Michael Maloney for Suffolk County District Attorney, and you should too.